When left moves right, the decline of the left and the rise of the populist right in post-communist Europe. This is the title of the exciting new book from Dr. Maria Stegavaya, our very own uh, CSIS senior fellow here on the Europe-Russia-Eurasia program. Uh, the book is out today from Oxford University Press. Uh, as our regular viewers know, Maria is is known for her, her Russia commentary. This book is a little bit different. It is focused on uh, the politics of, of Europe, in particular the politics of post-communist Eastern Europe, and, and essentially how the politics have shifted over the last uh, number of, of years, and particularly over the last few decades. Uh, we are also joined today by Dr. Dan Kellerman. Uh, Dan, thanks so much for joining us. He's joining us uh, all the way uh, from, from Portugal. Uh, Dan is a senior associate non-resident fellow as part of uh, the Europe-Russia-Eurasia program here at CSIS. He is also the McCourt Chair at the McCourt School of Public Policy at Georgetown University, where he focuses on the European Union, law and politics, comparative political economy, and comparative policy. So, Maria, let's jump right into the book. Congratulations, first of all. It's out today. Uh, everyone should run to the store. Well, first watch the event, then run to the store and, and buy the book, or you can you can buy it online. But, Maria, let's, let me give you the floor. Why don't you... Um, sort of give an outline of 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 what the book is about and, and why you wrote it. Yeah, and um, thank you very much. I wanted to start by thanking the CSIS, Max uh, and Dan uh, for taking time to do this uh, for me. Uh, to our audiences, so first of all, as a school of Russia, why uh, do I also focus on post-communist Europe? Well, uh, it's kind of ironic in the sense that at the time when I started uh, my um, d d a deep dive into my PhD, uh, it was back in 2013, and it felt like Russia was off the radar in political science. Ha <laughs> ha, so much for our ability to forecast uh, the future. Uh, and uh, certainly uh, the populism was hot, and uh, there was something that attracted attention just as Viktor Orban made his prominent speech about the illiberal democracy. So I was really fascinated by this topic. But then, of course, uh, the uh, relevance of the topic kept fluctuating. And by the time I finally signed the contract, I was quite disappointed thinking that nobody will be interested <laughs> well get, go figure unfortunately for better or worse i guess for better for me and worse for the rest of the world potentially uh, the topic still uh, remains quite relevant in 2024 as well and uh, to our audiences, I wanted to flag that one of the key uh, motivations behind writing it, for me, um, as I call myself a recovering economist, since my uh, region undergrad is actually in econ and then I later shifted into political science, um, was to try and understand the basic foundations of sustainability of contemporary democracy. So the key kind of... Um, inspiration goes beyond just post-communist region, which is fascinating for sure. But one of the goals is to demonstrate that the idiosyncrasy of the region is a little bit overstated. As, and as a matter of fact, we tend to see parallel processes unraveling across both Eastern and Western Europe, and of course, the United States more broadly. Um, now, what's the book about? Uh, so, uh, full disclaimer, uh, I should start by uh, saying that I'm actually a student of Evgeny Yasin, who is a very prominent pro-market reformer in Russia, so I do not certainly have anything against the market per se. But the book does talk about political cost of adoption of pro-market or neoliberal reforms, in particular the austerity reforms, by a, a particular type of parties, especially the left parties. Uh, what essentially I argue shortly is that when uh, left parties, uh, social democratic parties, ex-communist parties, uh, specific for post-communist region, adopt these radical pro-market uh, neoliberal reforms, it actually ends up being quite uh, consequential and costly for them in the long term. Um, something that actually was not noticed by early studies of this process, which actually tended to celebrate the pro-market rebranding of many of the ex-communist parties, which used to be communist, but then rejected this um, uh, Marxist dogma and adopted much more for liberal pro-market stance, uh, becoming holier than the Pope sometimes mm -hmm. in the embrace of the pro-market reforms, as one of the of my um, uh, commentators in the book pointed out, uh, ended up eventually uh, 
um, de-aligning de or pushing away the traditional electorates of the left parties. Uh, by traditional electorates, I mean uh, social, economically vulnerable groups, working class electorates, um, or others who are not very... Um, nicely often described as uh, transformation losers or modernization or globalization losers. Uh, these groups are mo the most susceptible to pro-market reforms uh, because what are the pro-market reforms? We're talking um, radical d decrease in redistribution, right? Trying to make the, the budget sustainable, uh, decreasing the debt, uh, perhaps um, um, elimination some of the social benefits. Usually those are the uh, policies that are most important for economically vulnerable groups. And when their parties, or who, the parties that they think are supposed to protect their interests, adopt these reforms, in the long term this tends to push these parties away, uh, these groups, the electorates away. And in turn, and this is the second uh, part of the argument, that tends to provide an opportunity for other actors, often as I show, populist right actors uh, who uh, use a combination of redistributive appeals and also nativists like anti-immigration uh, appeals to attract these electorates. As a result, uh, we often see in the countries with so-called rebranded uh, left parties, uh, as social democratic parties declined in popularity, populist right parties grew. So these are process, these are not just uh, coincidental um, uh, processes. As I showed, there's actually a causal uh, relationship there. And uh, I argue, um, to conclude, uh, this is a very important um, dynamic to track, uh, because we actually uh, don't want the populist right to be too uh, um, strong in the societies. The adoption of um, very nativist uh, agenda tends to be increasingly polarizing for this for this politics the um, uh, conflation of um, the, the the competition along the cultural dimension and the conflation of uh, economic liberalism with political liberalism allows this party uh, substantive uh, 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 after some time, uh, consequently, to reject a lot of the important elements of political liberalism, hence the uh, liberal democracy by Orban. So this is the dynamic that we need to wars, uh, watch very closely, given how consequential it uh, has become for Europe and the West more broadly. Yeah, I think one, one of the main factors when you look at European politics and the current sort of seeming instability of a lot of governments is that the, the coalitions of many European countries, European democracies, and this is in Western Europe in particular, were very, you know, it was sort of very boring. There would be a center left party, a center right party, and they just sort of every once in a while flip flop uh, who is in power. But now creating a coalition can be much more difficult because we've seen the collapse of center left parties in particular in, in places like France, uh, but, but elsewhere. And I think one of the fascinating things to me is you note that there's, you know, we tend to have thought about this as sort of a clear sort of Eastern European story, the rise of kind of illiberal parties, uh, Orban, uh, Law and Justice, the far right party in Poland that, that until recently was uh, holding power. Uh, and that it seemed to be a cr pretty clear narrative, right? You had the 90s, you know, it was post-communism that created a lot of dislocation. The, the former parties in power became center-left parties, but adopted pro-market reforms, therefore became unpopular. Uh, but then also other cultural issues emerged. But, but what you identify is that this isn't simply an Eastern European phenomenon. And I think what we're seeing right now uh, over recently, I think your book sort of predicted this and or predicts this. I, I know you weren't working on it for a long time, but we have far right parties that, you know, uh, the main party in, in uh, the, the second most popular party in Sweden, for instance. So wh why do you think there's this connection between Eastern Europe and Western Europe, despite the fact you know, coming from very different starting points, especially in the 1990s. Yes and no. They are sort of coming from very different uh, starting points. At the same time, they're actually coming from the same starting mm -hmm. point. Now, first of all, the whole rebranding, the idea of rebranding, it started in the West in the first place. I actually um, start the um, chapter one by discussing the so-called third way, uh, the rebranding, uh, which was actually pushed forward in the West by the Western uh, left parties. Why did they suddenly decide to adopt more pro 
market policies. Uh, that is because, first of all, um, it has become increasingly obvious after in late 1970s in the West that this old school, hardcore Keynesian uh, redistributive policies are not very sustainable. We'll remember great inflation, for example. Uh, so that wasn't going to work, especially in a world that was becoming increasingly globalized. So if you want to be competitive with countries like, uh, I don't know, China, you actually want to have more, um, l less redistribution. You want to have a little bit less uh, uh, controlled economy and more openness in the economy, which in in uh, its turn was starting to erode all these uh, social benefits that were offered to multiple groups. Uh, plus, as these economies have become more post-industrial, so they transitioned away from this uh, traditional industrial uh, basis, uh, the traditional electorates of the left party started to shrink. So they, they weren't just as many blue-collar workers anymore to vote for these parties. They realized they needed to expand uh, their electorates. And that's why they started to slowly but gradually discuss uh, this adoption of much more um, uh, pro-market platform. One interesting example, rhetorically, is the switch, and you'll find it in many um, uh, social democratic parties platforms, from equality to equity. So mm -hmm. it's like still equality, but not so much, um, that doesn't necessarily exp express itself in specifically social economic outcomes. Um, now, uh, fast forward uh, 1990s, um, at first it looked like for the Social Democrats things were working out nicely. They rebranded and while they kept at first the working class traditional electorates, they were also able to expand into more middle class upper uh, uh, white collar classes and therefore they were actually initially very successful electorally. At the same time, post-communist Europe starts to open up and the co old communist parties are faced with this dilemma where nobody likes them anymore because the communism obviously collapsed and they really want to reject the past. There's a lot of great books, including, including Anna Grzymala Busse, who has worked a lot specifically on how this rebranding has unraveled. And at first, uh, it seemed like a great idea. Everybody's rebranding and uh, uh, these uh, ex-communist parties, they have traditional electorates that have nowhere else to go, so they'll vote for them no matter what. At the same time, they may become more modern, more rebranded, and uh, expand the platform by um, also attracting the middle classes um, in the corresponding societies, which were, tried, were just starting to shape. Um, now, one thing that uh, these countries did not uh, realize is that the composition of the electorate was a little bit different for um, the post-communist Europe and Western Europe. Mm -hmm. First of all, uh, post-communist countries are to a lot of still quite industrial economies, and very often uh, the industries were actually relocated from Western Europe into uh, Eastern Europe. I show, I have a chapter devoted specifically to composition of electorates, working class combined, like the groups that belong to those professions uh, still constitute up to two thirds of the electorate. And uh, just uh, um, um, that per se uh, actually made the rebranding of the left parties very, very consequential. Uh, in addition uh, to that, these are the electorates with a communist legacy. And as we know from a lot of other work, uh, this legacy left uh, this affinity for distribution. So what um, um, kind of seemed to have gone more smoothly for uh, social democratic left in the West was much more consequential electorally in the East. Now, last but not the least, in post-communist Europe, everything kind of happened at once, and the degree of transformation was much, was much more radical. To, in a lot, uh, to, that's one of the reasons, by the way, why I started working on post-communist Europe too. It's just very convenient to study. There is just a very clear cut off mm -hmm. when everybody starts adopting uh, reforms, and it's not as extended over time as we've seen in the case of the Western Europe. Uh, the process was somewhat delayed by the EU accession, Everybody wanted to be good students before the EU accession, so the, uh, the, <laughs> the electoral consequences of this rebranding wasn't felt until after uh, the EU accession was secured in these countries. But once it was secured, this is when uh, post-communist uh, left parties felt really serious consequences of their choices. This is when the electorates said, hey, that's, uh, that's it, we can't take this anymore. 
as alternative actors, like populist right actors, emerged and appealed to these groups. In the West, we've seen this dynamic uh, unraveling along very similar fashion, but it was much more extended over time and perhaps a little bit less consequential for the left parties just because of um, slightly different dynamic uh, across both regions. Yeah, of course, the, the EU ascension for uh, most of these countries in Eastern Europe happened in 20 years ago, in 2004. And so then the period uh, that you are starting to see the backlash is actually before uh, the 2008 uh, economic recession, but then accelerates Even after further that. by the financial crisis of 2008, exactly. Yeah. So you see uh, these populist right parties that popping up and gaining in popularity straight right after the EU accession and all the way until now. Um, unfortunately, many of them are still quite successful electoral across the region. Let me turn to Dan, but one more just question on this. I mean, it then seems the migration crisis that we then start to see in, in 2015 in particular in Europe is then sort of an accelerant as you identify, not necessarily the cause of the rise of these, of the far right. Exactly. Writers. And in general, the one of the main kind of perhaps controversies about this book is um, um, I'm not denying the role of culture, but I'm certainly arguing that cultural dimension or is not everything that uh, that is to the story of the populist right. Yeah. Uh, are populist right supporters like more racist, xenophobic, um, you know, anti-immigration oriented than the rest? Potentially, but it's not why the populist right is more successful. As I show, in fact, uh, absolute levels of xenophobia, uh, for example, across the region, d d have not changed radically, at least throughout the period uh, under my consideration, and yet populist right fortunes have fluctuated quite dramatically. So it's not explained mm -hmm. just by the levels of xenophobia. It's something else that uh, is happening there. And my major point is the populist right is the most successful when they combine uh, two um, um, kind of elements that work particularly well for these uh, lower um, uh, economically more vulnerable social groups, that is nativism, anti-immigration stances, stances and redistribution. Uh, it's very hard in general, I think, to divide, uh, to kind of, to argue that it's just culture and no economy mm -hmm. at all, right? Because cultural argument is often framed, economic argument can all often frame through cul cultural lenses. Yeah. For example, anti-immigration, right, argument. It's true that for many of these workers, uh, blue collar electorates, uh, working class electorates, uh, immigrants, uh, lower skilled immigrants do constitute an immediate uh, competition. So when they're anti-immigration oriented, it may be for cultural reasons, but it may be also for economic reasons. We don't know. And the same um, uh, issue comes when it comes to nationalism. In many of these countries, for populist right parties obviously embrace this more nationalist agenda, but nationalism also often has this very strong economic element to it. Like we are the strong country, right? We will create our own economy. We don't have to depend on these multinational corporations that are stealing our um, profits, our the products of our work, and we will stand alone in a position to glo globalization, et cetera, et cetera. Hence, my contribution is in particular to bring back the focus on economy. Economic arguments are not the only ones that matter, but they sure matter a lot. Right. As we've seen a lot of parties say socialism for us, not for them. So in using in that, in some ways, it's a cultural argument about immigration, but it really has economic undertones. Dan, I want to uh, bring you into this conversation uh, and, and maybe to ask you generally, what are your, your take on, on this topic and also on, on Maria's book? Well, thanks. And thanks for having me and giving me the chance to talk about uh, Maria's terrific new book. I mean, my my biggest impression overall, and I just read the book in the past few days, it's an incredibly impressive piece of work uh, that's really rich empirically, kind of combining all the best methods in political science, a lot of data, statistical analysis, detailed case studies of Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, Slovakia, and even experiments, you know, these kind of survey experiments. So it's really state of the art and very convincing in, in the, the kind of argument that you just heard Maria articulate. And I think really what it, what it does a better job of than any work I've seen in the field is two things. I think it, it provides, and you alluded to this, Max, it provides an integrated explanation 
uh, that ties together the changes in party systems we've observed in Eastern and Western Europe under a kind of common framework. So that's the first thing. And also, um, it integrates in an impressive way, um, or in a kind of unified way, uh, the two biggest trends in those party systems in East and West, which is on the one hand, the rise of the far right, but on the other hand, the decline of the traditional center left. There's of course, a lot of literature on both topics but sometimes it's a bit separated, and she shows how they really go together. Dan, one you know question that sort of comes uh, from from the conversation from Maria's book, um, and I'll start with you and Maria if you want to jump in as well. But that you know this is not a region that has experienced. Uh, uh, economic hardship really over the last 20 years. You look at, for instance, the growth in Poland, uh, it's rather exceptional how fast uh, Poland has grown uh, economically. And yet you have um, uh, the far right in law and justice uh, being the, gov uh, the, uh, the, the governing party and up until recently uh, losing control, but still being the largest party. And, and so, I, I guess, does that complicate the economic narrative that there's actually been tremendous economic growth over the last 20 years? And, and so how do you think about this in terms of um, the, the economic growth that we're seeing and yet the kind of economic discontent that I think is, is truly there? You know, it's a, it's a great point. And you're absolutely right that, you know, as a whole, the region has experienced, uh, in particular, the, the sort of Visegrad countries, those four, experienced a lot of growth in the past couple of decades. Poland, uh, maybe the most dramatic case. Uh, but nevertheless, the transition also produced a lot of losers who Maria uh, referred to earlier. So while uh, you know some younger, more educated workers who were definite winners from that transition, there were a lot of long-term losers uh, who, who really suffered, and you know that's one element of the appeal. And those losers are you know, sometimes regionally concentrated. You know, it's there's the class base that Maria talks about, but you also see that play out in different regions. And I guess I would one little thing I'd add. Uh, you know, this is almost a bit of a question for Maria. Or what, the one thing I'd problematize is sort of to say. While I think she does a great job of showing, um, you know, the the reasons why there was support for these populist far-right parties and a decline in support for the center-left. I do think it's striking that in some of these cases, the let's say in Hungary and Poland, the populist center-right, once they got in power, of course, we saw them seize control over the media, manipulate uh, electoral systems, all these kind of autocratic moves. And that kind of makes me question, well, if you're really so popular, why do you need to rig the system? <laughs> but, uh, Maria, I'll throw that that over to you, and 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 I mean, to Dan's point that that if if democracy is working in your favor, you don't really need to work to undermine it. Uh, is it because that 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 there's you know that then they suddenly become the party of uh, of uh, that's in power and there's a reaction against them and they're trying to hold on? How, how would you react to Dan's? Uh, both questions are great. Uh, so uh, on Dan's question, that's why I point out that I explained the rise of the populist, right? Not the uh, sustainability in power, right? The um, uh, when, uh, voters, as one thing we see uh, from the analysis, I think, is that voters across uh, the uh, region, uh, while perhaps the democracies themselves are fairly young, right? The voters are, demonstrate a lot of rationality to them, right? They're voters for, they're voting for the par parties that actually seem to either cater or not cater to their demands. Uh, in the case of Poland, for example, and Max, this is also to um, address your question, Poland was one of the uh, one of the puzzles for me as well, because conventional economic arguments did not seem to work precisely for the reasons you flagged. Poland is actually one of the only countries in the region not to e even, even have an economic growth during the 2008 financial crisis. So it really had no um, any serious economic issues. And yet you've seen the rise of the populist right. But the rise that happened even before the immigration crisis. So it's not the cultural argument also. So my point is that this is exactly where you need to add the political explanation, the political opportunities explanation into the argument. It seemed on paper that things were great in Poland. But if you dig deeper, you see that consistently 
parties that come to power, be they left or right, they keep implementing the same um, agenda. Economically, it means uh, austerity, more reforms, uh, more um, more pay painful economic adjustment, and not so much not so much of de delivering on the social promises that they make while competing. So uh, the so-called reform losers, they are repeatedly left without representation. And as a result, uh, in the long term, the, the voters eventually um, uh, kind of uh, get together and vote for the party that actually does cater for the interest, which uh, the law um, and justice uh, end up doing, right? We know that they did introduce, especially after um, uh, 2015, um, this um, um, known uh, policies such as family 500 plus etc in a number of policies which are somewhat redistributive catering to this uh, platform having said that uh, to dan's point it's one thing to win the election it's another thing to, to stay in power for a while and uh, um, i think it would have been very hard for these parties to sustain themselves in power with uh, these policies alone which by the way the, the the sustainability of these policies is actually quite in question uh, when it comes to law and justice policies at the time when I was writing this book, they were still in power, and many economists I interviewed, they were actually uncertain about how sustainable uh, these policies are going to be in the long run, because mm -hmm. they are not very pro-market for, for the reasons that I have explained. Uh, so they want to hold on to power, and therefore they uh, implement all these uh, um, autocratic liberal policies. Uh, what is helpful to them, though, I already made this point, but I wanted to flag, they are assisted by, this, uh, by the ability to conflate economic liberalism with political liberalism, because in the region, the economic openness coincided with political openness, so democratization coincided with marketization. Uh, voters don't often distinguish between like where the misfortunes come from. Maybe like why am I suddenly worse off economically? Is that because of the market, or is it because the parties in power are all corrupt and they only represent the interests of the evil elite? Mm -hmm. um, and that provides that sentiment and that double opening um, provided these uh, um, actors the possibility to conflate uh, political liberalism and economic liberalism in the eyes of their voters, and therefore as they um, uh, backlashed against economic liberalism, they also introduced a lot of politically illiberal policies that Dan has referenced. So at least in my book, I'm able to answer that question, that they're able to successfully conflate both political and economic liberalism in the eyes of their voters. Dan, I saw you uh, nodding along. I mean, it, it does strike me that the economic liberalism, that, that the, the far-right populists are you know, are not your sort of traditional economic conservatives, that they're reacting against the, the market liberalism. And, and do you agree that there that that also becomes sort of um, a glide path into the, both illiberal, but also sort of the, the strongman uh, style politics that we t have have seen in sort of Viktor Orban's Hungary? Yeah, I mean, I don't think it has to be uh, in the sense that, uh, uh, you know, some of the uh, sort of welfareist policies, uh, you know, that they've embraced could have, and as Maria points out, well, have been embraced. You know, we can imagine a different world where center-left parties went back to those or embraced those. I mean, the one element is the kind of welfare chauvinism aspect that Maria talks about, where uh, that lends itself to the the kind of populist thing, where you're you're emphasizing um, that you know these. These policies are only for the sort of real Poles or the real Hungarians, and you're trying to um, you know, blame uh, migrants or minority groups, whether it's Roma or things like that, uh, for issues. So that that side of some of these policies, uh, or maybe the the unorthodox policies like targeting foreign multinationals with special taxes to try to you know underwrite some of this, some of that plays into it, but. But I, I think, as she points out, um, you know, the real the real issue is, uh, you know, the, it's the old saying, nature abhors a vacuum, and it's sort of when the center left uh, basically abandoned this kind of welfare state agenda, not abandoned completely, but you know, moved away from it more and more, and started being, uh, you know, the actor implementing uh, neoliberal policies that created this opening, and then. The, the far right cleverly melded uh, these kind of welfare policies onto their 
far right cultural appeals and nationalism, and it worked. And it was a winning formula, as she convincingly shows. May I just yeah. jump in quickly? May, many thanks, Dan. I will just follow up on that by adding two points. First of all, uh, I do only explain part of the variation. Uh, so I certainly see that the populist right, and I show that quantitatively, do get some of the uh, ex supporters of the left, but it's definitely not. It's just uh, a share of a fraction of all of the populist right electorate. So there is much more to the story to which, uh, among other things, Dan, uh, Dan alleged, uh, obviously, there there's more happening, and I'm not claiming I'm explaining everything there is, there is to populist right. Second, as I show on the example of the Czech Republic, and particularly Slovakia, we see equally uh, situations or cases when uh, our left parties are able to, again, see an, an economic opportunity and jump added and the the political opportunity and this political opportunity emerges precisely when uh, left parties implement this painful economic policies austerity usually which end up being de-aligning sorry for the lingo um hmm. the um, uh, pushing away the traditional electorates that means suddenly a group a large enough swath of voters are available for mobilization and uh, it depends really who is able which other party is able to see that opportunity and jump at it uh, uh, in Slovakia, for example, Robert Fico, Smer SD, has been equally quite successful. It was a splinter party of the uh, similar social um, democratic uh, party, uh, party of uh, the party of democratic left, uh, which actually decided not to go with the flow. Uh, the party of the um, uh, social democratic um, uh, left in Slovakia actually continues uh, continue to implement the reforms, uh, often comparing itself, themselves to uh, surgeons who have to do the you know painful but important uh, operation on Slovak economy. And uh, Smer, Smer said, no, we're going to go on our different direction. And while doing so, they all the time actually effectively defeated this more uh, reformist uh, left wing of the party. Uh, similarly, as I show in the um, case, case of the Czech Republic, the Communist uh, Party, which did not really rebrand uh, as much uh, following the transition, also provided this uh, counterbalance in the political system. It captured all these reform losers who otherwise would have been available for mobilization by populist right. And as a matter of fact, I show how over time, at least throughout these two decades that I, I trace, um, the, the war of various populist right parties, uh, somewhat marginal, uh, one of them Workers' Party, for example, a very telling name, by the way, mm -hmm. also demonstrate which electorates they're competing for. Uh, they try to, again, mobilize these groups, but these groups were already incorporated by this left party, and so uh, that provided limit, a limited opening for uh, the populist right, until, at least until the immigration crisis started to unravel. We haven't mentioned the EU that much, and that's sort of one of the common threads that links both Western yeah. and Eastern Europe. And and Dan, you know, one of the things that you know, oftentimes American conceptions of the EU is well, the EU is this sort of socialist, you know, left enterprise that is, you know, about regulation. Indeed, it is, but that it's it's about uh, a sort of non-market based economy. And in fact, it's the opposite, where the EU sort of enforces a degree of of uh, sometimes austerity, but sort of orthodox economics. Uh, and, you know, the single European Act was actually Margaret Thatcher's, uh, you know, one of the, the main advocates of, of that in the, in the 1980s and in, in really creating a single market. Um, I'm curious if you see the kind of rise of the far right and the decline of the, the center left as being tied at all to the to the kind of constraints that are created by the EU. Uh, and, and do you think that this is an EU-wide phenomenon and what is the role of the EU in the story of the rise of the, the populist far right? Yeah, no, thank you. And um, I'll say Maria, I'm sure will come in after. She has uh, you know, very insightful takes on the EU in the book as well. I mean, my own two cents and I think the first thing to say is just on this question, you know, is the EU push right policies or left policies? You know, I think, as you said, there's sort of two narratives about the EU, and that tells us something. On the one hand, let's say um, it was a big drive. Uh, one of the motivations for Brexit was that the uh, Tory kind of 
Right-wing free marketeers said the EU is a product, a project of continental social democracy strangling our economy with red tape and regulations and all this worker stuff. And, you know, we need to free ourselves up. On the other hand, from the left, if you're talking about more far left parties, they'd say the EU is a neoliberal project dedicated to, you know, this single market and helping big multinationals and hurting uh, workers and unions. So what does that mean if you hear opposite accusations? Probably the truth is a bit in the middle, right? That the EU is a compromise engine and its policies are kind of more in the middle of the spectrum. And so when you look at it from one side, it you know, uh, looks left. When you look at it from the other side, it looks more uh, economically conservative. Okay, so that's the first thing. But then I guess what I would say is this. It's definitely true that the EU both um, with the criteria imposed for Eurozone membership. So that was a big constraint for countries, you know, in the West uh, and then for countries in the East uh, that were trying to join various conditions that were put in place for accession, et cetera. The EU definitely was imposing constraints on economic models that um, pressured governments, including these left governments in some cases, uh, to uh, implement neoliberal reforms. So there, there is definitely truth to that. But I, I would say this, I don't think the EU is as constraining as it's often made out to be. Just because let's think about it for a second. The EU contains within it a number of economic models, right? We have, you know, sort of Anglo-Saxon type more neoliberal economies like Ireland. We have social democracies like Sweden. So the EU, um, you know, within the union, you know, there's room to pursue different policies. Um, but I, I think often politicians also use the EU as an excuse or a scapegoat uh, to blame for maybe policies they wanted to implement anyway because they've, you know, bought into these ideas and that sort of thing. Yeah, I guess if you're if you can be critiqued both from the right and from the left, sometimes that 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 can help contribute to a a populist narrative about you. But Maria, over to you on on the role of the EU in in, in the trends that you identified. Well, I certainly echo um, uh, all of Dan's points, uh, but I do want to point out that in my uh, book, the section on the EU is called "The Road to Hell, The Road to Hell is Paved with Good Intentions," mm -hmm. which uh, kind of uh, already um, <laughs> communicates some of the ideas. Uh, the EU is extremely important for the timing. The main puzzle for me was trying to figure out the timing of the emergence of the populist right. And just as we discussed, I thought I cracked it once I realized uh, that really the timing of EU accession played a crucial role. Mm. Uh, because until then, uh, it was not just the EU, as um, Dan has co correctly pointed out, but also the desire, the natural desire of those societies to just really make it to the West, right? It mm. was the EU membership is really the symbol of finally making it, right, becoming part of the West, uh, broadly understood. And as Christopher Holmes, among others, point out, the momentum uh, driving this, uh, you know, aspiration to join the EU, uh, they sum it up by this motto, imitate the West, like whatever it takes. Uh, Slovakia's example is very illustrative because Slovakia was actually uh, like in behind throughout the 1990s uh, in terms of the reforms. But uh, once the Hungary uh, uh, the Czech Republic in Poland have secured your accession. Uh, they they received more like the roadmap towards the EU and Slovakia did not. It created this huge momentum for many, many parties, not just left, but also right in Slovakia to get together and finally uh, replace a previous more authoritarian uh, government, which was in power throughout the 1990s. So certainly uh, the EU, it was beyond just the EU, was just inspiration of the societies. Uh, but and it's also not just the EU, but also the IMF, the combined mm -hmm. effect of both of those uh, institutions, as I argue, was extremely important. But as the um, accession neared, once they secured the accession, several things have happened. So first of all, uh, the um, uh, w the carrots were like fewer, like less less influential. Now that finally they got it, uh, what they wanted. Uh, simultaneously, the cost of the um, accession has become much more uh, pronounced. 
and uh, particularly consequential, at least according to my analysis, were the budget cuts introduced under the EU Maastricht criteria. Uh, there were a lot of um, um, protection policies imposed throughout the 1990s in mm. many of these countries to protect local labor markets, among other things, which uh, uh, the EU accession, the, the reforms associated to the EU accession tended to erode, which in turn uh, conditioned uh, growing like dissatisfaction across uh, the the societies and um, again when the accession was secured it allowed a lot of leeway for um, uh, various political actors to politicize this frustration uh, one good example would be Hungary's Fidesz which actually while uh, they did adopt quite um, um, uh, reactionist agenda already somewhat in uh, late 1990s in response to the Bogros fac package, the first austerity reforms introduced by the left. Once in power, uh, they won the first election in 1998. They actually continued along the same pathway uh, towards the EU accession because it wasn't secured yet. Mm -hmm. It's not until uh, 2000 mid-2000 and later that uh, finally Fidesz this really starts to rebrand and adopts this increasingly more populist agenda. Uh, most data sets do not classify Fidesz as populist until uh, 2010, actually. But mm. you can argue a little bit before, but certainly not in 1998. And this is when they become most uh, successful also electorally. They are much more flexible now in what they get to say because it's not going to cost them EU membership anymore. As we see, a few things at all seem to cost EU membership to Viktor Orban. Uh, it, he seems really immune um, in that regard. And uh, they allow, um, essentially, they receive a lot of leeway. Uh, Slovakia, perhaps, is the most illustrative in the way um, this input, the importance of EU accession tends to tended to uh, erode uh, the um, the support for uh, social democratic left. It was precisely with the impetus of hurrying up behind uh, the other Visegrad four um, countries that the uh, left, the, so the social left in uh, Slovakia adopted these reforms. Uh, they were in a rush. The reforms were painful. They were successful. They were extremely successful. Uh, Slovakia has achieved remarkable. Um, a breakthrough economically, but it really cost uh, the social democratic left um, the the control. They did win a subsequent election, but afterwards uh, the the party collapsed and was replaced by what you can argue is a populist left, essentially mm -hmm. smear SMRSD, still popular in Slovakia until now. Does this create any lessons learned for the EU as it approaches? Uh, potentially and hopefully, I think, uh, a future rounds of enlargement uh, for Ukraine or for the Western Balkans. I mean, it seems like there's a sense of national unity and priority to sort of get into the EU. And then once that's done, then uh, there, there's sort of a backlash to some of the, the effort that was done. Maybe it's like you've done all this exercise and you've you've finished the race and now you want to just eat, you know, eat, <laughs> eat, eat, eat all the junk food that you weren't uh, eating as you were training. But I don't know, Dan, what are there sort of as we think about this, you know, lessons learned, because I think one of I think throughout after enlargement occurred, there was sort of a backlash because if, you know, seeing what happened in Eastern Europe with Hungary and with Poland and the sense that, well, if you enlarge, you could be enlarging to more populist right. But now there's, there's populist right in Western Europe. It's not a unique phenomenon in Eastern Europe. I'm curious if you think there's sort of lessons learned for the EU as it thinks about future enlargement. It's a great question. And I think, you know, if, if we go back through these rounds of, you know, the EU imposing constraints and what the repercussions were, I don't think the EU really learned lessons, at least initially, from, you know, any of the damage that it's, you know, Maastricht criteria or, you know, different accession criteria imposed. Uh, we see that because then, you know, when it came to the Eurozone bailouts, they all imposed even more onerous uh, uh, restrictions and you know the troika and everything but then if you look i think they finally learned some lessons from that because you know then when it finally came to let's say the covid recovery funds of course the context is somewhat different but then i think you started to see uh, a little bit more of understanding you know the eu uh, that you you uh, you couldn't follow that same template of micromanaging you know demanding cuts etc 
So hopefully when you pull all that together, you know, the approach to Moldova, Ukraine, you know, Balkan countries, we can hope they'll uh, take some lessons about the potential for backlash. I, uh, but, you know, honestly, I think it's too early to say, and it really just depends uh, on the governments that come through because, you know, the, it's not just the EU or the commission or bureaucrats that are really demanding these criteria. It's governments and the council, you know, the, the EU is imposing a lot of constraints, you know, often because German um, governments you know, believed in them. And so we have to see, you know, what are the other governments represented in the council? Dan, it, I'm glad you brought up the, the 2008 crisis and, and uh, because that seemed to, Maria, certainly give rise to the popul populism in the West, then fueled by the migration crisis. And now there's sort of a narrative, I think, that uh, especially after the Dutch elections where the, the far right party led by uh, Gert Wilders, where it was an election really dominated by uh, migration issues in Sweden, we saw something similar, that if there's now a, a debate that if, if the center of the political discussion is about migration, then the far right does quite well. Uh, how, what do you think of that narrative? And, and, and do you think, how does migration sort of play in to, to the far right? I mean, you pinpoint the economy, but, but now it seems like w w migration and, and immigration are really dominating politics on both sides of the Atlantic. Um, by its very nature, the populist right in, uh, for where I come from is going to be more successful politicizing the anti-migration agenda. And uh, uh, the effort, like, first of all, I think uh, more broadly, right, beyond this book, populism is some sort of uh, somewhat of a democratic response to where uh, corresponding electorates and societies perceive mainstream parties' failures, right? When they believe certain issues not addressed, there is this non-conventional, uh, non-mainstream parties emerging trying to uh, take this agenda. Unfortunately, very often, uh, the way they adopt this agenda is very um, detrimental for corresponding policies, uh, specifically uh, the far right. And in general, when the um, pol competition shifts to the cultural axis, we tend to get into the realm of identity politics, which is very polarizing. It's very hard for us to find common grounds this way. Uh, therefore, I actually hope that the book will offer some policy solutions for, uh, pro uh, you know, for the competition to try and shift the competition back on the economic dimension because it's much easier somewhat to find uh, really acceptable policy solutions along the economic dimension, right? There's There are things to share uh, there. Um, I do make this point that uh, when left parties try to uh, radically um, rebrand themselves along themselves as, along the con uh, cultural dimension and compete with populist right on the um, 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 specifically this anti-immigration uh, platform, they unfortunately not, they, for them, unfortunately for, for them, they're not very successful because they tend to break down the electorates, some of which uh, may be willing to uh, um, uh, agree with this anti-immigration agenda, but others, uh, usually more middle-class, white-collar uh, groups, they are less um, susceptible to this agenda. So it's hard for the left to win uh, back its uh, traditional electorates through without uh, losing um, the um, uh, white uh, white collar support uh, on the um, by adopting the anti-immigration agenda alone. Uh, more broadly, however, and this takes us back to the um, um, issue of. Uh, the lessons learned for the EU, um, it seems, and the book is kind of hinting at it, that contemporary democracies um, are looking for a new balance, for a new status quo, uh, because the old one, uh, which relied on the social democracy, uh, which emerged in the Second World War in the aftermath of the processes, which you could argue echoed something that we observe today, because 1930s in Europe was somewhat reminiscent in the sense that, again, you've seen a lot of disarray, crisis, and populist right far-right groups politicizing this resentment. In a lot of ways, um, that problem was resolved uh, throughout the second half of the 20th century by uh, social democrats catering to the demands of the lower income groups. Globalization and the, as all these processes that we have discussed, also immigration, which is part of the globalization, have eroded that status quo uh, that emerged throughout that period. And one of the problems, I think, with the liberal democracy today is that the new ideal balance is yet to be discovered. Mm -hmm. uh, social democracy is not what it used to be. Globalization, uh, immigration, they're 
Uh, they're destabilizing for this old status quo, but the new one is yet to be emerged. These populist right parties are politicizing this idea of coming back, like make America great again, essentially going back to the old status quo, but it's not feasible under this new economic dynamic, most likely. Mm -hmm. So the real answer to this question, I think, is yet to be found. I think until we get there, uh, we are to witness this quite tremendous period for liberal democracies in the West with uh, the various types of political actors, unfortunately, politicizing it. Right. I think, you know, you book really points out the death of, of a lot of these major center left parties. And that really seems as we sort of look ahead, creates a degree of real um, political fragmentation, uh, dislocation. It's sort of difficult to form coalitions. If you think about uh, a, a number of countries, you know, France, for instance, uh, Macron basically destroyed both the center left and center right uh, through the emergence of his of a new party, which then sort of unified the center. But then now in France, you have a party on the left and a party on the right and a party in the center. And 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 the extremes, you know, there's a danger that one uh, uh, on the extremes may win. So, I mean, as we look forward, uh, Maria and Dan, I mean, do you see an era of just continuous sort of political instability where you have difficulty of, of uh, in Europe of, of governments forming coalitions? You think about the German government, uh, Spain, for instance, with Pedro Sanchez, that in a more stable center left, center right situation in Spain, yet even that trying to form uh, governments seems e extremely challenging. So is this going to be uh, an era fraught with sort of sort of democratic political instability as we look ahead throughout the, the next decade? Maybe, Dan, I'll throw that to you and then to Maria. Yeah, and it's a great question, Max. And as you said at the beginning, um, I'm speaking to you from Portugal and just maybe start here, Portugal and, and Spain, I uh, think across Iberia, these are two of the, the places where it looked like the center left had pretty successful models, right? Uh, despite the decline of center left mm -hmm. parties in so much of Europe. Um, but then here in Portugal, a uh, combination of uh, scandal uh, and you know other trends in society is now we're about to have elections in March, but you're seeing the this was a country where there was no populist far right uh, party, but now this new party Chega is uh, looking to get uh, polls are saying maybe 20 percent. They're going to be the number three party. So it just shows you how quickly things can change. Spain, I think Pedro Sanchez's model is worth studying how he's succeeded and might be a role model for others on the center left. But even there, it's a very close run thing. We know um, he's you know just barely hung on the last elections. And I think I, I do think things will be fraught because what you've seen in many of the party systems is this increasing fragmentation of the vote across more parties. And the real question is, you know, how do you maintain kind of moderate uh, pro-democratic coalitions uh, you know that exclude populist um, potentially autocratic forces especially on the right but potentially in some countries on the left like we have that in Greece and so uh, you know, that then makes the calculus um, yeah more challenging for those parties and then there's a lot of temptation for centrist parties to ally with these radicals um, you know, for expediency and that can be very dangerous, as we know. Right. It seems like one of the major questions dominating much of European politics right now is how does the center right party work with the the right party? And you could see this in a future German election, for instance, where that will be a major question. It's an issue in Sweden uh, was potentially exactly. thought to be an issue in Spain, but then Pedro Sanchez pulled it out. But, but Maria, to you. Yeah, certainly, you know, as I have started this conversation with uh, forecasting is not the strongest suit of political scientists. We are best <laughs> at explaining why things happened um, the way they did. Um, having said that, one of the main takeaways of the book is that uh, ideally for sustainability of um, uh, today's liberal democratic policy, policies, you want to split this electorate of populist right. And for that to happen, you need to have a viable uh, redistributive left alternative on the other side of the spectrum, uh, because that way at least part of these groups who that otherwise would have joined uh, the populist right electorates they remain on the other side of the political spectrum and that creates this like sort of checks and balances of course uh, of like as Slovakia's case demonstrate uh, the left can also be populist easily but usually less radicalized less illiberal uh, the um, uh, FISA for example has adopted also nationalist pop uh, platform but it's called national nationalism light 
mm-hmm. at least throughout most of the period. So uh, it's a little bit less polarizing, and the competition still unravels along the economic dimension rather than cultural dimension. So we are a little bit further away from this politicizing identity um, d- domain, which may become uh, extremely dangerous, as we as we know from the history of the European continent throughout the 20th century. Uh, so unfortunately, no perfect uh, recipes, and then as correctly pointed out, all of the temptations and difficult calculus for the parties. Uh, but at least one uh, lesson is clear. Uh, it's important to perhaps uh, keep this electorate divided, and so there must be a competitive uh, left, redistributive left option uh, for these groups uh, to go for. Mm-hmm. Having said that, overall, I remain optimistic, obviously, f- about the prospects of the Western democracy. I think there is a term- terminalist period ahead. We're already like, throughout this period in the, mi- in the midst of it. Eventually, though, the, if history is any, um, uh, any example, any lesson, uh, there will be uh, a possibility for these parties to learn and perhaps to create new uh, coalitions as this re- as the dealignment and realignment of the electorates uh, finally concludes with a new status quo. And, and, you know, when we think about the populist right, I mean, we, we have around five minutes left, but has has there been evolution in, in splits within the a populist far right or different categorization potentially where some far right populist parties sort of maintain the kind of uh, they don't sell out, so to speak, that they um, remain sort of very anti-system, very anti-EU. And then others start to sort of resemble more like a center-right party. And you could argue that, uh, you know, Giorgio Maloney in Italy, Brothers of Italy, a, a, a party with neo-fascist roots, you know, from the far right, you know, very populist. Yet, you know, in some ways you could argue she's governing as kind of a conservative center-right uh, uh politician. And so are we seeing kind of a normalization of part of the far right that then will make this kind of, well, the far right sort of, sort of bleeds into uh, into a traditional center right? Yes, absolutely. We do see that. And that's one of the things that makes me hopeful. In general, as I said before, in my opinion, having studied populism for about a decade, I think it's somewhat a healthy, it's somewhat unpleasant, but a healthy democratic response, right, to the existing problems, the ways electorates see them, right? The mainstream parties are not, um, uh, account, like, are not reflecting certain policy positions of these groups. And so there are non-mainstream actors emerging. But over time, these actors, at least some of them, have a tendency to what's mainstreaming uh, that's that's an, that's a, that's a, it's, it's a term uh, in political science main, um, so as the far right groups becoming more mainstream it's very kind of ironic though because this process is still in 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 flux in hungary for example uh, your big radical right used to be the real far right while fidesz was more conservative mm-hmm. and over time they kind of switched uh, places so in hungary this dynamic certainly did not unravel in the desired way now the largest party Fidesz is actually even more radical as Jobbik actually has become more mainstream um, in an effort to expand its uh, electorate uh, and even sided with actually social democrats in one of the elections in the past. Uh, so that uh, that actually is, is in process but in general, yes, you do see uh, this dynamic where uh, formerly marginalized, radicalized actors are becoming more mainstream and uh, therefore less dangerous for democracies. Another thing is um, this is uh, right out of my Russia um, putting on my Russian hat, um, I also have done a lot of um, analysis of their position towards Russia. And the good news is that these parties are fundamentally, in my opinion, democratic in the sense that they're following the electorates. And while they used to be this big, uh, um, in, they had, have this affinity with Putin's Russia, after the invasion of Ukraine, which really horrified many of the electorates, of even uh, radical right electorate, populist right electorates across Europe, they shifted, as we've seen in Italy and other places. So they actually follow the electorates. They don't follow um, other um they're not maybe as uh, in a lot of ways they're very opportunistic but they're not ideological Mm -hmm. and it has good news and it has bad news the bad news is that 
well, can we trust the electorates to, mm. to, pick the, to make the right choice? Uh, but the good news is that there isn't like fundamental like affinity with autocratic states there. It's more about what seems to be more politically feasible, politically attractive in the moment. And as long as we're able to keep their uh, electorates in the mainstream, right, less radical, these parties will follow these electorates, hopefully, uh, towards more sustainable liberal democracy going forward. Great. Dan, any final thoughts uh, from you? I guess the one thing I'd say on this topic of you know mainstreaming, I think one has to be careful. Sometimes these parties uh, also may sort of pretend or pitch uh, that they're becoming more moderate in a desire to get in power. I think when PIS in Poland um, ran in 2015, they put uh, a Zidlo uh, as their candidate for prime minister rather than Kaczynski because they were saying, oh, this is you know a more moderate face. But then once in power, they sort of unveiled their full autocratic program. And so I think we have to um, you know, we have to be wary. We see like with someone like Le Pen kind of moderating or um, in the Netherlands, Wilders, they're calling him Milders, like mild, right? Because he's <laughs> pretending to be mild. But then you have to worry what they'll do if they really get um, control, you know, in their hands on the reins of power. So that's one caution. Well, Maria, thank you. I think one of my main takeaways to quote James Carville is that it's the economy stupid and that that when political parties take their eye off the economic uh, situation, that that tends to create real openings. But congratulations on what is a fantastic book. Um, it is uh, it is available uh, at wherever you uh, buy your buy your books. You can buy it from Ox Oxford University Press directly, or from local bookstores, uh, or from other major online platforms. It is now available today. Um, and additionally, if you like these conversations, uh, be sure to uh, take out your phones and actually subscribe to our podcast uh, Russian Roulette, where Marie and I uh, co-host and, and uh, have have uh, have. Uh, great exchanges with uh, numerous experts on Russia and the, and the war in Ukraine, uh, and as, as well as our other podcast, The Eurofile, where we often hear guests like Dan uh, talk about all the things that are happening uh, in Europe. So thank you so much for joining us, and we'll see you next time.